First of all, uh, let me uh, thank the Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade, uh, Socialist uh, Republic of Vietnam, uh, and uh, AREA, the Economic uh, Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, for inviting me uh, to this event uh, to give this talk. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be here and very pleased to be uh, back in Vietnam. I have visited Vietnam a few times, but it's always a pleasure to be back. Um, and particularly, uh, it's a privilege to be uh, sharing some thoughts uh, on an issue that uh, I think is uh, quite critical for the developments that lie ahead for this region and indeed uh, for the, the whole world uh, because uh, this is the region which is the rice bowl uh, of the world. Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, all major suppliers of rice in particular, uh, which is the most widely uh, consumed uh, cereal grain um, for millions and millions of uh, people. And uh, to discuss uh, the changes and the challenges uh, that lie ahead of us, uh, uh, it, it's a very uh, important uh, uh, event. So to summarize the, some of the points that I would be making uh, or discussing uh, very briefly, given the time constraint, um, there basically seems to be you know, two big issues. If this region is to go from where uh, it is now uh, to a region of high value added agriculture, uh, it, it is a major agricultural producer, uh, but there has to be a leap forward into high value added agriculture. And in doing so, uh, two issues uh, arise. What are the policies? Uh, that governments in particular can adopt to help uh, producers, agricultural producers um, in this region uh, exploit the market opportunities that are there. And secondly, because agriculture in this part of the world is dominated by millions of small farmers and producers, small fishes, uh, small uh, uh, and medium enterprises. Um, how can we make sure that in making this transformation, uh, the benefits will accrue uh, in an equitable manner uh, to all these uh, small uh, farmers and producers? So let me begin by just setting uh, the background and context. Uh, the Deputy Minister actually uh, provided a very good overview of the, uh, the general context. Uh, uh, so some of what I'm uh, going to present is actually uh, repeating the points that uh, uh, His Excellency already made. And this is a region um, of rapid growth. You know, after years and years of uh, conflict and, and uh, turbulence uh, over the past uh, two and a half decades, uh, the region has been growing very rapidly. Um, as you can see, uh, uh, in the last 15, uh, 14, 15 years, it has been uh, on an upward path, uninterrupted uh, upward path uh, over this period. And it's also a, a region uh, of great diversity. Uh, Cambodia, uh, Lao People's uh, Democratic Republic, Myanmar and Vietnam, they've all grown rapidly, but they still remain low-income countries, though Vietnam is uh, considerably more advanced than the others. Um, and what has driven uh, economic growth in this uh, region has been fundamentally policy and institutional changes. Uh, and this has enabled the region to actually take advantage of global opportunities and also opportunities within the region itself. 
the connectivity uh, within this region uh, has improved a lot and is in the process of further improvement. As a result, um, international trade has grown very rapidly. Uh, you know, as you can see from this figure, there was that dip immediately after the global financial crisis, uh, uh, but the trend has been uh, very much uh, upwards. The network of uh, uh, roads and infrastructure developments which are connecting the region. Uh, we, when we get to agriculture, there are a number of points that uh, we should always bear in mind. One, agriculture remains a major source of employment. A large pr proportion of the population lives in rural areas. However, the share of agriculture in GDP is smaller than the share of employment and is declining. Now by itself, this is not a cause for concern. Uh, economic development uh, is always accompanied by a shrinking share of agriculture in the uh, overall uh, economy. Uh, but what is of concern is not that. What is of concern is the productivity uh, of agriculture. We should be ideally in a situation where even while the share of agriculture declines as a proportion of GDP, agricultural output and productivity must be increasing. At the moment, uh, labor productivity in agriculture uh, in this region is quite low uh, compared to uh, uh, developed, uh, not only developed countries, but uh, more advanced countries, even in ASEAN and the region. Labor productivity in the GMS region, uh, particularly in the CMLB countries, is low. And now that is a cause for concern. Now, what's the general context that uh, agriculture is operating on? There are three main drivers which are dramatically transforming uh, both the supply side and the demand side of agriculture. Uh, in the case of uh, the demand side, there has been very rapid uh, economic growth uh, accompanied by a lot of urbanization. Now, the, the absolute uh, levels of these vary from country to country, but the trend is very clear. Uh, this is part of, uh, indeed, uh, very much a central part of the most dynamic uh, uh, growth region in the world. Uh, urbanization has been proceeding everywhere. Uh, secondly, uh, there's also been both regional uh, integration and uh, embrace of globalization so that the, the economies here are integrating more closely with each other while also integrating with the rest of the world. Um, which means that we are becoming much more interdependent uh, in terms of both uh, good shocks and bad shocks, good developments and bad developments. And thirdly, very important in the region uh, is uh, for agriculture is that uh, pressures on the natural resource base have been intensifying, uh, both uh, directly man-made and to some extent indirectly man-made, as in the case of climate change. And, and this is a very sensitive, ecologically sensitive uh, part of the world. Uh, so, these are, uh, you know, broad uh, uh, developments uh, which then are leading to big changes in the composition of demand, the kind of demand for agricultural products. It used to be that uh, 
you know, most people basically uh, want to survive with subsistence type agriculture, um, eating uh, a diet primarily composed of cereal grains with some additional supplements, uh, but primarily a rice-based or rice and wheat-based uh, diet uh, uh, in this region. Now what we are seeing globally is a context, and also regionally is a context where the demand for staple cereal grains rice, wheat, and so on. It's growing, but it's growing much more slowly. Uh, compared to very rapid growth in demand for higher value, protein-rich uh, foods. As incomes increase, uh, people want more diversified diets, uh, richer diets, and we see that reflected in the composition of demand for agricultural products uh, in, in the region and more, glo uh, uh, more broadly, globally. And together with this, we also see that demand is shifting towards uh, better quality, better standards, high levels of food safety, and so on and so on. Uh, this slide should be projected increase in demand for crop products. This is not uh, uh, production, this is demand. Uh, for things like uh, rice and wheat and so on, demand would continue to grow, but more slowly. On the other hand, if you look at uh, global demand for livestock, fish and so on, it's growing very rapidly uh, throughout the uh, throughout the world, particularly in developing countries, because developed country markets uh, are pretty saturated with some of these things. In developing countries, uh, the market is growing very rapidly. Uh, you may be aware that uh, uh, there used to be this idea that uh, people in North Asia <coughs> could not uh, consume dairy products. But demand for dairy products have been growing even in China very rapidly. And in recent years, the fortunes of uh, the New Zealand economy, for example, uh, have boomed uh, primarily because uh, of uh, demand for dairy products uh, from North Asia, uh, primarily uh, uh, China, but also from ASEAN. In the case of fish, a big change uh, is, is, is beginning to occur, uh, which is important for, uh, uh, for the Mekong region, uh, because future demand will have to be met. The growth in demand uh, in particular, but even in absolute terms, more and more of future fish consumption, which is projected to grow quite a lot, will have to come from aquaculture, not from uh, uh, going out and fishing in the sea. Uh, and this is a region which has enormous potential for aquaculture. Uh, as we know, uh, Vietnam has uh, already uh, become a major exporter of uh, catfish and so on. And in response to these changes in demand, uh, we are seeing big changes in the value chain in, uh, uh, in agriculture and food. Uh, it's becoming modernized, it's becoming more sophisticated, uh, it's uh, uh, becoming more integrated. Uh, and this is creating uh, opportunities in the marketplace uh, for higher value added uh, activities all the way from production uh, to, the, to the retail outlets. And in this context, uh, as you know better than uh, I do, uh, this region has responded. Uh, we have seen high value added uh, uh, agricultural uh, industries uh, emerging, developing, even in the case of traditional uh, products like uh, uh, rice. A lot of non-traditional uh, uh, exports have uh, 
uh, because you uh, play a major role in countries' trading structures. And uh, these are all very positive uh, market developments. But when you look at the opportunities, uh, which are huge, uh, to fully exploit them, uh, there are also major challenges. And that's where uh, all the issues come down uh, to discussions uh, in this and other fora like this to ensure uh, that these challenges can be met and overcome. So if you look at the demand side changes uh, and the, the corresponding uh, responses from the supply side, we see rapid urbanization, expanding middle class, the so-called Asian middle class is uh, already quite large and, 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 and growing. Uh, we see changes in the way that food in particular, but also uh, uh, other agricultural products are marketed. Uh, supermarkets are spreading throughout the region. Um, the multinational enterprises operate, beginning to operate uh, everywhere. Uh, and local uh, uh, chains emerging and expanding. Um, and what we see is that while these developments are taking place, they tend to, in general, favor large-scale producers and processors because there are good sound economic reasons for this. In many of these activities, uh, there are economies of scale. Not in all, but many of them, there are economies of scale. So whenever there are uh, economies of scale, uh, it tends to uh, favor uh, large-scale uh, production, processing, and, and, and sales. Uh, so in terms of policy, this gets back to the, the two points that I, I made earlier. Uh, it's how to uh, ensure that the, we respond, this region responds to these challenges, but also ensure that the small farmers and producers and SMEs uh, are able to cope and benefit from these changes. So there's a whole range of uh, uh, issues which I will not uh, go through in detail. Uh, but infrastructure and logistical uh, services. The role of these become more and more important uh, as the value chain becomes uh, uh, more and more modern. When you've got to produce better quality things, when you've got to uh, transport them to, uh, to markets, uh, when you've got to do that both quickly and in a, in a way that uh, doesn't affect quality, then you need better infrastructure, better logistical uh, services. And then, uh, you know, this is a region where a lot of barriers to trade have come down, but there still remain all kinds of barriers. Not necessarily uh, only the tariff barriers that we are all more familiar with, which have been taken out more and more uh, through, the, uh, through discussions in various fora for agricultural trade liberalization, but there are still a lot of other barriers uh, to do with uh, logistical aspects of trade. Uh, then there are uh, issues about investment. Uh, you want to develop value chains, you want to take advantage of uh, comparative cost differences in different uh, places, both within countries and across countries. You've got to be able to move uh, capital and other factors of production and the final goods uh, very easily and at low cost. Um, and when it comes to agriculture, we have a whole range of challenges uh, in this area, even though the barriers to agricultural trade themselves have been coming down, the, the, though there still remains uh, uh, quite a few important ones. Um, then how to uh, ensure that we get good agricultural practices? Uh, I wouldn't dwell on the need for uh, technology and innovation for better production processes and cultivars and so on. We take that for granted. But on top of that, we got to ensure uh, good agricultural practices, particularly in the form of climate smart uh, agriculture because of the, the challenges we face. 
and then the issues of uh, small producers and SMEs, and then related to that, I will uh, uh, touch on this again, uh, what kind of regulatory and policy settings are needed to ensure that small producers can integrate into uh, modern value chains where there is no abuse of market power uh, or, or, or minimize abuse of potential abuses of market power by the bigger players so that benefits can be equitably shared. So I wouldn't uh, go into detail uh, discussions on the, on the issue of uh, rice in particular. I know that there are other speakers uh, who will uh, discuss that. Uh, but of course, this region is uh, the world's rice bowl, as I said, and that ought to remain so, and all the efforts should go there. But I will, uh, I will tend to, uh, I will focus a bit more on some of the other aspects of uh, needed changes and other non-rice related issues uh, uh, because the region now needs to go from uh, a rice bowl to a much broader bowl of agriculture and food for the world. Um, so you've got to diversify the product mix uh, and you've got to diversify uh, also the destination markets for each uh, product. Uh, because uh, diversification is the key to survival and resilience in a world of a high volatility and instability. Um, so how to use the region's comparative advantage, which we know exists and is enormous. Uh, but in order to exploit that comparative advantage, we need uh, to use, uh, we need to get the complementary factors in place. Uh, but when it comes to diversifying, particularly in high value added products, the suppliers have to face up to the challenge of ensuring that they can meet standards. And I, when I say standards, I mean standards across a whole range of uh, dimensions. Uh, So just, uh, I was reading uh, while I was preparing this talk uh, about what was uh, happening uh, with agriculture in, in, in Vietnam, and I saw this news item in the, in the Voice of Vietnam, uh, highlighting two things. One, here's a new uh, major export commodity that has come up, dragon fruit, which, you know, 30 years ago uh, was you know, minor uh, part of the market is now a major, uh, it's, a, it's a major uh, food product. I can go to a, a supermarket in Australia and, and, and buy dragon fruit, which I wouldn't have seen uh, 30 years ago. Uh, so this is market response to uh, growing demand, but at the same time, his Vietnamese market is dominated uh, the external market is dominated by China, and why? Uh, because it does not set that strict uh, requirements uh, on quality. So you end up exporting uh, to, a, some, to one market, you become dependent on that market, and uh, since then, I don't have to, uh, uh, to mention it, uh, uh, in this audience, uh, and the issues with uh, fish exports to the U.S. from Vietnam. Uh, you depend on, you, you supply to the market, uh, and then the, the, the goalposts change in terms of what the market is supposed to uh, expect. So these are all issues that uh, farmers producers and governments have to deal with. Uh, this is part of uh, being uh, integrated with world markets. There's the economics of world markets and the politics of world markets. And policies must uh, be formulated to be aware that uh, in the marketplace almost anything goes and you've got to be prepared to be flexible and nimble in handling uh, issues as they arise. 
So overall, uh, how am I going for time? Okay. So there's this issue of uh, quality, safety standards, you know, every market where you want to export to, and increasingly, even in urban markets, uh, particularly urban markets, even in this region, uh, issues of food safety uh, become increasingly more important. Consumers demand uh, better quality, better standards of food safety. Then if you want to start selling uh, things like organics or you want to meet other standards, the traceability issue, uh, which now the, the, the Americans, I understand, are, are pushing hard on the catfish uh, uh, issue, the traceability suddenly this comes. But this is bound to happen. These things are bound to happen. Uh, the whole issues of uh, certification, uh, traceability plus certification plus uh, you know, uh, what, what levels of pollution are there or not. Uh, all this means that you need to have technologically sophisticated processing, packaging, storage facilities, uh, uh, labs to do the testing, and then reliability of supply. Uh, it's very important uh, uh, because uh, where agriculture uh, is weather dependent, uh, supply issues arise intrinsically because of weather, but there are also uh, uh, issues of uh, supply instability that arise from the behavior of supplies themselves. And if you are, uh, if you are upstream, uh, if you are downstream in the, in the supply chain and, and, uh, and you are supplying another market somewhere, you want to have assured supply and how do you, do, how do you ensure that you have assured supplies when you are dealing with uh, thousands and thousands of uh, small producers. So these are all real issues uh, that one has to cope with. Uh, in, in export markets, uh, all of these issues become magnified. Uh, you've got to be able to access uh, 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 foreign markets, meet uh, sanitary, <coughs> phytosanitary uh, requirements. And on top of that, uh, you also got to meet other, sometimes even more stringent requirements imposed by uh, supermarket chains, for example. So in terms of policy, it's, uh, you know, it's absolutely essential that we have not only trade liberalization, but trade <coughs> and investment liberalization. Because you cannot have uh, regional supply chains. Uh, if you can only move goods uh, easily, but you can't move factors of production, particularly capital. Uh, and something that uh, research uh, demonstrates over and over again uh, is that uh, foreign, foreign firms uh, can play a major uh, role. Uh, they can also do really bad things, but in the right, given the right conditions, Foreign firms can play a very positive and important role in this kind of agricultural value chain uh, and, and production uh, uh, modernization. Because they can provide technology uh, upgrading, uh, even, uh, but also access uh, to foreign markets. Uh, they can provide access to foreign markets because uh, they know the rules of the game. Uh, they have got market information, they have been operating in these markets, uh, uh, so they have got the context, uh, they have got uh, the, uh, the linkages, and all of these can be important. But at the same time, domestic uh, firms can and uh, ought to uh, uh, use these uh, opportunities and develop further. They should, this does not mean that they should forever remain uh, small, uh, minute firms. If you think of the CP group in Thailand, it's a great example of how uh, 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 a firm from a developing country, a uh, small firm uh, initially, from a developing country becomes a mega multinational uh, uh, in, the agricultural, uh, in the agricultural production uh, sector. 
But this is a process where you develop relationships, you develop contacts, you develop uh, uh, linkages, so that domestic uh, firms and foreign firms can come together and work together uh, to the benef mutual benefit of everybody. Uh, and here, one particular uh, uh, importance of having linkages uh, with foreign firms is because of the politics of international markets. Uh, you know, as demonstrated over and over again, uh, the rules of the game in terms of market access to foreign markets change because there are always lobby groups in foreign uh, countries uh, which want to restrict uh, uh, competition from, uh, uh, from foreign uh, uh, imports. Uh, sometimes they are from foreign imports, sometimes one firm already is importing from uh, uh, one country and, and another firm that wants to uh, get something from another country and you got uh, competition. So domestic lobbying in the political process is a, is a fact. It's a fact of life. This places particular difficulties uh, on exports of agricultural products in particular from uh, de uh, developing countries. Because this is where these rules can be very easily manipulated. Uh, sanitary phytosanitary regulations, even the WTO mandated uh, regulation, they allow a lot of leeway for each country uh, to manipulate them. Uh, they look like scientific uh, 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 reasons, uh, but in fact are, are protectionist uh, uh, reasons. Uh, so one, one advantage of having uh, a, a, a partner in the country uh, working with you is that because they're in that place, they are in a position to lobby better, lobby stronger, uh, do the alliances, do the politics uh, to minimize the damage that can be, can be caused in terms of restrictions to market supply. So in the region, uh, there are things that governments uh, ought to do, and, and it's particularly uh, uh, interesting for me that uh, uh, this, this particular uh, forum brings together not just agriculture or not just trade, uh, but agriculture and trade people together. Uh, and as uh, Professor Nishimura uh, pointed out, uh, you know, this is where the action is. Uh, you've got to get both production and, and processing in agriculture linked with the transport trade uh, aspects, which are also essential if you are go going to have modern uh, agriculture in the region. Um, now, as I said, we know that uh, this has been a region of uh, enormous uh, uh, step forward in the area of trade liberalization. Uh, so tariff barriers have come down uh, enormously. However, we still have very high trade costs, even moving goods within the region. Um, they've been coming down, but it has to do with trade facilitation issues, logistics, uh, etc. Uh, for both for, act, for establishing production networks in the region, where you've got to be able to move uh, across uh, borders within the region, but then to move things to distant markets, you've got to. Uh, address these issues. And some of these issues uh, really are relatively low cost in terms of the money funding investment that is needed. It's a matter of will and, 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 and uh, pressure to go ahead and make the changes. Thank you. Uh, the region is becoming, uh, it's easier. Communication is getting better because uh, we have the ICT revolution. This offers uh, great opportunities to, uh, to uh, enhance uh, 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 trade uh, and, and logistics uh, in this region. Uh, and there's huge scope, because at the moment, uh, logistics is obviously lag lagging behind. Uh, 
uh, this is an area where improvements, potential improvements, uh, uh, can be made uh, and ought to be made uh, if you were to go forward. And then uh, uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, you know how millions of uh, small producers and SMEs can share the benefits. You know, I, I often go to fora where particularly uh, NGOs and other social organizations say, if you get, uh, if you get the large firms uh, to operate or foreign firms to come in, uh, they're just going to come and exploit the poor farmers and, and small producers, and they'll get wiped out, and all the benefits will be captured by, uh, by the foreign firm. And uh, a lot of people will actually end up worse than before. This is a legitimate concern. There's some research uh, that ADB has done in, 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 in uh, Indonesia, uh, which shows, yes, uh, it can happen. But the challenge is how not to let it happen. Because the other option is not an option. You cannot modernize. This region cannot go forward uh, with high, into high value uh, uh, high value added agriculture unless we integrate and work with these value chains, the high value chains, the, the global value chains, uh, work with foreign firms, work with large firms, processes, and so on. So the real issue is how can governments help uh, and how can other social organizations help? This transformation that is a necessary transformation from small farmers, SMEs, to make the transition to become modern enterprises. This is necessary. We cannot cling to the past. The people cannot survive and, and thrive and be prosperous on tiny uh, pieces of land producing as their grandfathers uh, and great-grandfathers and uh, great-grandmothers and so on did before. You got to make the change. Uh, and in making the chain, uh, they need assistance. Small producers, small farmers, they lack resources, they lack access to markets, they lack access to credit, they lack access to lots of things. Now some of these things, the governments can help by facilitating the private sector, market responses, market institutions to emerge. They should provide both some initial uh, assistance, but most importantly, provide a conducive policy and institutional environment where you can get sustainable market institutions to develop. Uh, then you can think of organizations, uh, farm organizations, cooperatives, contract farming, all kinds of things which enable economies of scale to be uh, captured while making the transition uh, into integration uh, 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 into uh, value chains. Uh, so I put down a few points that I wouldn't elaborate, but uh, we could take them uh, up later. Uh, now what's the global context? Uh, you know, immediately if you look ahead, we are operating in what has been the worst economic times in our lifetimes, and I'm quite old. Uh, and and uh, really, we haven't seen anything like this in the, since the 1930s uh, in, in the global economy. A period of very sluggish growth, uh, major economic shocks. Uh, and and uh, from this region, uh, rapid growth in China was uh, it stimulated economic growth everywhere uh, in, in, uh, in the last two decades, but that's slowing. India is a growing market. Uh, has potential, uh, but there are big uh, issues about whether it can actually take on the role that China played uh, in the past. Then there are all these other changes like uh, TPP, uh, which will have direct impacts on Vietnam as a, as a member country, uh, but will also have uh, impacts uh, everywhere else. Uh, in, but uh, it's not all bleak. Slow down in China uh, if it happens in a in a in a, uh, a phased manner and in a gradual manner. If it switches its 
development uh, uh, strategy from high investment driven to a more consumer-led uh, economy, what that is going to do uh, is that it's going to import a lot less minerals and raw materials and, and, uh, and so on, but it will start to uh, generate demand for a lot of consumer goods and particularly for agricultural uh, uh, products. So the, the change in composition of demand could actually work uh, to re-emphasize the importance of agriculture, not only for feeding people in the region and addressing the food security issues in the region, but also uh, it will actually expand uh, the, the market outside. Uh, so there's a market opportunity is uh, moving up there. And being placed here, just next to this uh, region, India on that side, China on this side, uh, and now increasingly the world markets at your doorstep uh, because of developments in transport and communication. This is the way to, uh, to move forward. So I guess my final message is, uh, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm basically repeating uh, what uh, His Excellency the Deputy Minister uh, started off saying, uh, you know, slightly different wording, but I say embrace You've got to embrace globalization and modernization. We cannot go back to the past. That's, that's not an option. So you've got to uh, enhance the development of value chains, but make sure that you've got the right regulatory measures, policy measures, institutions set up so that small farmers, SMEs, domestic consumers can benefit and share 